Good morning. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Welcome to Mount Vernon's First Congregational UCC's online worship for this, the sixth Sunday in Easter season. We continue to hope and pray that you are staying safe and well. I am Laura Ackert, the music director and the liturgist this morning. I'm going to read a psalm and then our lectionary lesson from the Acts of the Apostles. Pastor Scott will then preach a sermon and provide a pastoral prayer and benediction. Our pianist this morning is Krista Brady. She just played a beautiful introit and will play the final hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. We also encourage you to look up other hymns or music online to help you in worship and meditation and prayer. Before I start the liturgy, the church and staff want to remind everyone to continue to be safe and healthy. We turn now to our scripture readings. I'm starting off with a reading from Psalm 90 and then I will read Acts chapter 17 verses 22 through 31. Here is Psalm 90 verses 1 to 2 and 16 to 17. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you have formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. Here is the lesson from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely, extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands. As though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things, from one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they, will, they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and even some of your own poets, poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of our mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Through these words our God is still speaking. Thanks be to our still speaking God. Good morning. One of the first words in today's lectionary reading from Acts is Areopagus. The word that's easy to stumble on. It's the name of an open-air place just outside of Athens where a local council would gather and hear debates and issue verdicts. And Paul went there to argue that the Christian teachings that he brought to Athens were grounded in intellectual concepts and authority. In the Greek tradition of validating religious claims back then in such a debate, Paul needed to demonstrate, one, that he represented the deity, two, that the deity wished to reside in Athens, and three, that the deity's residence in Athens would benefit Athenians. 
In the lectionary cutting today starts today's reading with Paul making this sort of a demonstration. Paul starts by cleverly introducing himself as an authorized representative of a deity that the council had already heard of and even had a shrine to already in Athens, the unknown God. Paul asserted he could make the unknown God known to them, that the unknown God is the one who made all of creation and that this God transcended residents and shrines like those in Athens and, and therefore required no Athenian residence. Paul also pointed out that this deity was not seeking admission into the pantheon because this God was already everywhere. Paul notes that what this one God sought was for humanity to seek God, this one God who was as close as wherever a person could be. Like the Greek poets that claim Paul pointed out that in God we live and move and have our being, and that not only was God as close as where every person was, but that every person was God's very own offspring. And the lectionary cutting ends with Paul claiming God wanted humans to change their ways, to repent so that they could be judged in righteousness through the one whom God raised from the dead, meaning, of course, Jesus the Christ. And if we read just past the lectionary cutting on to verses 32 and 34, we learn that the debate ends with some of the council scoffing at Paul and the resurrection of the dead, some wishing to hear more, and some who joined Paul and became believers. And I have to confess that I used to not like Paul. I was a, a modern-day scoffer. I heard out of context Paul's letters, most of those falsely attributed to him, and considered him to be very sexist, homophobic, and so unjust and unloving based on those false letters not written by him. I thought of him as a zealous narrow-minded Christian, someone I was sure I would never have anything in common with, let alone like. However, I must confess today that I'm no longer a scoffer of Paul. I understand him now to be a good man and a good and faithful servant to God and Christ and to humanity. I like Paul a lot these days. And one, of, one of the verses in the Bible that Paul wrote has even become for me a, a shorthand for what Jesus' way leads to, and frankly, what every church should be aiming to. The verse is Galatians 3.28. Paul describes the, the heart of what loving your neighbor looks like. I think of it as the equal rights Christian mantra. Paul proclaims in no uncertain terms that, quote, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. End quote. Even before I became a Christian, I was for such equality. To me, that language, those words, epitomize justice and kindness. And now, as a Christian, and as clergy, Galatians 3.8 succinctly describes for me the goal of the words of Micah on the Old from the Old Testament that are on our sanctuary wall, seeking justice and loving kindness, walking humbly with God. In the New Testament phrasing, the equality in Galatians sets out the ends that are reached through the means of fully obeying Jesus' greatest commandment, to love God and neighbor as we love ourselves. Even as I deeply appreciate Paul's equality text in Galatians, the text that probably resonates the most for me is his physical description of God. As many of you might guess, it is in our last week quoted it a number of times during the pandemic already because I think it's so important to understand that God's right here, everywhere, with us. You see, Paul understood God not to, to just be out there, 
in heaven, inaccessible to creation. We do simultaneously be Lord of heaven and Lord of the earth. The quote is Lord of heaven and earth. And Paul understood God to transcend creation while at the same time being not far from each of us, imminent in our existence. God is so close, so much a part of existence that it is in God that we live and move and have our being. Everywhere we go, there is God, there is Christ, the name that Christians give to God incarnate. I understand God in this way too. I'm with Paul. I don't imagine God just up there somewhere reaching in to stir an earthen pot when petition for help or when God wants to otherwise interact with creation. Rather, God is always in the here and now, soaking us and it through and through like water surrounding and saturating the sponge. And I take great comfort in knowing that God soaks us all, that God is what we move around is what we live in, is where we have our being. To use Paul, Paul's imagery from the reading, all we have to do is to grow up in front or behind or to the side or even inside ourselves. And there is God. God permeates all of existence. And that God is not in any way limited by human confinements set out in religion. As Paul pointed out, God is not bound by shrines. God's not attended to nor made by human hands. God is not an image formed by the, by the art and imagination of mortals. God is boundless, everywhere, ubiquitous, and not controlled by humankind. The quality of oneness in Christ, and Christ being God's boundless incarnation that we exist in, are the intellectual, the theological, the thinking side of spirituality that I find myself in accord with Paul. There's, there's more to Paul's understanding of God than the abstract ideals of love played out to create equality and put us on a saving path to right behavior. And there's more than Paul's understanding that it's intellectual, theological descriptions of God. You see, Paul, first and foremost, arrived at what we call Christianity through a deeply personal, profound, mystical, and spiritual experience. As a young man, he had persecuted followers of Jesus. As Acts 9 tells it, Paul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And then a light flashed from heaven around him. He fell to the ground. And he heard Jesus' voices asking why he was persecuting Jesus. And then that voice told Paul what he was to do. We're told in Acts that Paul was blinded by the light for three days, and eventually his sight was restored. And then he was baptized and became a Jesus follower and an apostle. And we know, too, that Paul went on to become the greatest missionary of all time. The abstract ideals and theological descriptions and the whole of Paul's ministry were lifelong responses to his spiritual experience with Christ. So are all of his letters. They're grounded in his spiritual experience. It's common nowadays for many modern Americans to say they are spiritual but not religious. I suspect many that say that, I was one, do not want to claim they are religious, thinking religions must entail too dogmatic an approach to God, or what they've seen of religion has seemed rather ugly. But rejecting religion when claiming to be spiritual is a bit ironic, since the word spiritual, by definition, means a relationship to religion or to religious beliefs. In fairness, though, much of religion in our media does not appear to be very nice. The religion that's hijacked our airwaves can be, or seems to be, self-centered, lack of love, and ungodly, and it does not serve to connect many of us to the sacred. Religious folks in our lives can also appear this way, too. Unloving, uncaring, making us want to run from religion. Now, not very nice religion actually can and does shoot people away from religion. 
And as a consequence, many of us choose to reject our religion, or we think we do, and, and so we name our spiritual encounters with the sacred, um, God-soaking creation, we name them as spiritual, not religious. Unlike the religion that we may encounter in the media, or even from angry religious folks we know, those real connections that we're making with the sacred, with God, fill us with awe and wonder and love which gives us well-being and hope and, and causes us to seek and provide well-being and hope to others too. And so I actually take heart knowing that many people who are claiming to reject religion are claiming to be spiritual, not understanding perhaps that the two are intertwined, but still seeking awe and wonder and love, which, which has connections to the sacred that God provides us with well-being and hope through. And what matters is not the nomenclature, but actually the connection to God and our response to it. God by whatever name or no name at all, like the unknown God, groping for and finding and grabbing the sacred, God-soaking creation, that's what matters. Making a connection to God fills us with awe and wonder and hope. That's how you know you've made it. It helps us have well-being and hope. And it causes us to give well-being and, and hope to others too. And in this time of great upheaval and unknown with the coronavirus pandemic, such connections and responses are incredibly important. We need as many people as possible experiencing and working toward well-being all across the world. We need as much hope as we can get and give. And we can find the sacred that leads us there, right where we are, wherever we are, whenever we reach out and grope for it, God is there. Throughout Paul's letters, he signs off with the salutation in Christ. And that's actually true for everyone. We are all in Christ, in Christ. God incarnate, which fits with Paul's assertion at the Areopagus that we live and move and have our being in God. Working toward well-being needs to continue to include work for the well-being of all, like most everyone is doing during the pandemic in some way or another. In 2 Philippians, Paul writes an explanation of how following Jesus leads Christians to do this sort of global care work that we see many, many people doing. Paul wrote, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. As we live and move and have our being in God incarnate, and we Christians name Christ Jesus, let us continue to strive to be of the mind and the nature of Christ Jesus. Let us have the same love, doing nothing from ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than ourselves, and not just look to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Let us strive to be Christ's hands and feet and voice in this very, very difficult time. Let us strive to be Christ's hands and feet and voice all the time. May it be so. Amen. Well, now is the time for us to lift up a prayer. We call it a pastoral prayer in our church. Um, and I want to name just a couple of things to lift prayer up for out loud, and then we'll, we'll um, have our prayer. One is that gratitude for the leaders of this church, to the shepherds who are reaching out to members, and to Brad and Dave and Scott who are 
working with the contractors renovating this church. Pretty soon um, they'll be painting and doing stuff in here with scaffolding and we'll have to move down to the chapel. There's a lot of work going on. If you look at the little vlog video I did, I, I walk us around to show us some of that work. If you haven't seen it yet, you might want to check it out. I want to lift up healthcare um, workers and other essential workers who have done so much in difficult times and in danger as well, risking in, 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 a, in real sense their lives to keep us um, fed, to keep us healthy, to keep the world going. And I want to lift up thanks to you all for all you've done to help the church continue to be, for your offerings, for your support. And um, I finally, I want to lift up, as I have been for months, the leaders of all nations around the world, that they might be prayerful and careful and listen to where God is calling them to take us as nations, as people, and to follow that call. You may have other things you'd like to lift up in prayer. Please, please do that. Would you join me now? God, whom we exist in, please let your healing and comforting presence be experienced by our brothers and sisters on our own prayers. We also ask that your healing and comforting presence be experienced by all those this morning who are sick or in need of care, and also for loved ones lost and those who have lost loved ones. And we thank you, God, for all those joining us online in whatever holy and sacred place they are watching, you are surrounded soaking their existence. May your word and the love that fills the world and the spaces we occupy be a blessing to us all. And may our offerings of gifts to you be a blessing to the world. Thank you, God, for the blessing of being where we are all the time within our reach. Help us, God, as we strive in these difficult times to reach out and find you and lead us when we reach out to find you and have the same love as Jesus, to do nothing from ambition or conceit, and to look not just to our own interests, but to the interests of others. God, as a nation, we especially need help seeing all as one in Christ Jesus. In addition to the coronavirus pandemic, the disease of racism also continues to affect us, to raise its ugly head and hurt us. We had another young American killed because of the color of his skin as he jogged in a town. Ahmad Arbery was the American's name. God, please comfort and help heal his family and friends and community and African Americans and other people of color who face the terrible effects of racism day to day. A disease that hurts and haunts our entire nation. Please let your ever-present being help us all to rise up, to work to end racism in our nation across the globe. Help us bring in the reign of God where there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for we are all one. And now, God, hear us as we pray as one. The prayer that Christ Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, before we go, I want to thank again Laura and Krista, who have been so awesome helping lead these services, and for Denny for his midweek music that's been so uplifting and thoughtful, and to Scott and Charlotte, who have helped produce these videos every week. It takes a lot to put these together. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We appreciate your presence and we miss you terribly face to face, but we know you're out there and here with us. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. And go in peace, knowing that you are loved and that you matter.